Hello, my name is Dr. Michal Scanlon, and I'm going to discuss our recent publication in Science Advances. This publication is about modulating the pro-apoptotic activity of cytochrome C at a biomimetic electrified interface. This is a multidisciplinary um, article involving electrochemistry at liquid-liquid interfaces, spectroelectrochemistry, molecular dynamics, and also biochemistry involving the expression of mutant cytochrome Cs. Okay, so what I want to discuss is apoptosis, and specifically, I want to discuss cytochrome C's role in apoptosis. Cytochrome C adsorbs at the inner mitochondrial membrane in a cell. During cell death, an apoptotic trigger is sent. This causes a rearrangement of the inner mitochondrial membrane, where you get an increase of cardiolipin in its reduced form in the membrane. Now, reduced cardiolipin is anionic. And this anionic cardiolipin interacts with positively charged cytochrome C. And the interaction is such that the tertiary structure of cytochrome C is disrupted. Now, when the tertiary structure of cytochrome C is disrupted, this opens up the active site. And small molecules, such as hydrogen peroxide, can now penetrate the active site and get to the heme porphyrin that's there. They bind at this heme porphyrin, and they can be reduced, therefore, at the heme porphyrin. The electrons for this reduction come from cardiolipin also. So cardiolipin has two roles. It disrupts the tertiary structure of cytochrome C, opening up its active site to be um, accessible to small molecules, and it also acts as a sacrificial oxidant. Now, cardiolipin gets oxidized in this process, and because it's now oxidized, it no longer is able to bind cytochrome C efficiently, and cytochrome C can float away and leave. And at this point, the uh, release of cytochrome C causes apoptosis. It's the point of no return in the process. Now, what I'm particularly interested in is this step here. It's the interaction of positively charged cytochrome C with the anionic cardiolipin head group, leading to the disruption of cytochrome C's tertiary structure, and also the fact that cardiolipin is oxidized and releases cytochrome C from the inner mitochondrial membrane. So it's basically this step here in particular that we're going to mimic in our um, electrochemical cell. So what we do is electrochemistry at liquid-liquid interfaces, and we're using this to do a biomimetic electrified aqueous organic interface. Now, cardiolipin has a dual role, as I've noted. It acts as a disruptor of the tertiary structure of cytochrome C, but it also acts as a sacrificial oxidant. I'm going to add two molecules to the organic phase that do those roles separately. First of all, we're going to add the molecule, well, in the organic phase, you're going to have an electrolyte salt. So we need it because that electrolyte salt will conduct charge in the organic phase. And the anion of this electrolyte, uh, known as TB-, so tetricus, pentafluoro, phenyl borate anions. So these anions, the structure of which are here, will interact with cytochrome C and disrupt its uh, tertiary structure. The other molecule in the organic phase is the sacrificial oxidant. This is decimethylferrocene. Its structure is here. And decimethylferrocene acts as an electron donor. The do electrons are shuttled to cytochrome C, which can be used to um, reduce small molecules at its active sites, such as oxygen or hydrogen peroxide. So we're really mimicking the in vivo cytochrome C peroxidase activity seen in the mitochondrial um, um, membrane, at the mitochondrial membrane. So to recap, we have an organic electrolyte here, it's this salt, and this anion is acting as the tertiary um, structure disruptor of cytochrome C. Then decimethylferrocene acts as the sacrificial oxidant in the system. Now our interface is electrified, and this is important because you need to electrify the interface in order for this electron transfer process to be um, seen, to take place thermodynamically and kinetically. Okay. How do you polarize an immiscible aqueous organic interface? So this is our four electrode electrochemical cell, and it represents a way of doing electrochemistry in a dynamic, fluidic, membrane-like environment. We're doing electrochemistry here at a liquid-liquid interface, so its fluidic nature really is biomimetic, much more so than a solid electrode modified with, for example, polymers or self-assembled monolayers, which is typically used to look at the direct electron transfer of cytochrome C. Now, it's a four-electrode cell, so we have a platinum counter-electrode in the aqueous phase, a platinum counter-electrode in the organic phase. These counter-electrodes carry current into our system. We also have two reference electrodes, one in the aqueous phase and one in the organic phase. These monitor the potential at our liquid-liquid uh, interface. So, in our system here, 
uh, this is our electrochemical cell. So this is how we denote it. Here you have the aqueous phase containing 10 micromolar cytochrome C and a PBS buffer. Whereas in the organic phase, you have your organic solvent, which is trifluorotoluene. And this trifluorotoluene is very dense, it's fluorinated, and that's why your organic phase is on the bottom. You also have the BATB, organic electrolyte, I've discussed in a previous slide, and then the sacrificial oxidant, so 500 micromolar of decmethylpharisine. Let's look at some electrochemistry. So this is the electrochemistry we see in the absence of the sacrificial oxidant. So we have cytochrome C in the aqueous phase and just the organic electrolyte in the organic phase. So cyclic voltammetry at a liquid-liquid interface is possible, but the CVs that we get are not the same as the CVs in terms of their interpretation as you would at a solid electrode. Typically at a solid electrode electrolyte interface, the potential window is limited by a redox reaction, such as hydrogen evolution or oxygen reduction. However, in our system, the potential window is limited by ion transfer processes. At positive potentials, we get the ion transfer of aqueous cations from the aqueous phase to the organic phase and back again. So this is, in our system, the transfer of sodium and potassium from the water phase to the oil phase around here. Then at negative potentials, we get the ion transfer of the aqueous anion from the aqueous phase to the organic phase and back again. So this is the transfer of phosphate in our system. So these two ion transfer processes limit our available potential window. When we add cytochrome C to the aqueous phase, we get an increase in current here of positive potentials. And this is the first indication that at positive potentials, we're absorbing positively charged cytochrome C at the interface. So this makes sense. Anything that is positively charged will be driven towards the oil phase when we polarize the interface positively. Now, a much better way of monitoring adsorption at a liquid-liquid interface is to use differential capacitance measurements. So these are here, and the key piece of information from a differential capacitance measurement is the potential of zero charge. This potential of zero charge will shift if another charged species adsorbs at the interface. So if a cationic species adsorbs at the interface, the potential of zero charge will shift negatively. On the other side, if a negatively charged species adsorbs at the interface, the potential zero charge will shift positively. Now we have a positively charged cytochrome C, and if it adsorbs, the potential of zero charge should shift negatively, and that's exactly what we see. So this is a very definitive proof that we are adsorbing cytochrome C at the interface. Why is this important? It's important to have cytochrome C directly adsorbed at the interface because we have to have the minimum distance between cytochrome C and the sacrificial oxidant decimethylferrocene in the organic phase. This distance can be no more than one nanometer if electron transfer is going to happen between the oxidant and cytochrome C. So if we can adsorb cytochrome C, as we clearly have achieved here at um, in our system, then we have a very good chance of doing interfacial electron transfer um, with that protein. So now let's do that. Let's add the organic um, electron donor, decimethylferrocene, to the TFT organic phase and see what happens to our electrochemistry. So this is the same experiment as the previous slide, except now we have the sacrificial oxidant present, but you can see much more activity in the cyclic voltammogram. You've actually got two processes here. Cyclic voltammograms at liquid-liquid interfaces are capable of showing both ion transfer and electron transfer processes. Here at the negative potentials, we have an ion transfer process. It's the ion transfer of decimethyl ferrocinium cations. These are produced when the um, electron donor reduces cytochrome C. So you create the cation and it undergoes its own ion transfer over and back across the interface. We also have this large electron transfer process. This is the transfer of the electron from the oil phase to the aqueous phase, so from decimethyl ferrocene to cytochrome C, giving us this large current wave. Now, when we analyzed this um, current using a Randall self check analysis, we found that it was massive. It was 50 times what would be expected based on the very small concentration of 10 micromolar of cytochrome C we have in the aqueous phase. So something else is happening. And this is our proposed mechanism. What we have is cytochrome C acting as an interfacial redox electrocatalyst. You have the adsorbed cytochrome C at the interface, and it is being reduced by decimethylferrocene, which itself is oxidized and becomes a cation. Okay, so now we have created cytochrome C where the heme iron has been reduced from 3 plus to 2 plus. Now, this reduced form of the active um, heme porphyrin in the cytochrome C is capable of binding small molecules because we have denatured it slightly during its adsorption at the interface, 
and its interaction with the organic electrolyte anion. This cytochrome C reduces oxygen, forming either water or hydrogen peroxide, and in turn, this hydrogen peroxide can also be reduced by the cytochrome C in its reduced form and form water. So you have a catalytic uh, system working here now. You provide the electrons from the sacrificial oxidant, and then cytochrome C becomes reduced, and then the reduced form of cytochrome C um, reduces oxygen, and it's regenerated in its oxidized form once more. So this cycle um, plays out, and we get this huge catalytic wave. Now you can see that with each successive CV cycle, we get a dramatic reduction in the current due to this um, catalytic electron transfer process. And that is because the cytochrome C is becoming more and more denatured at the interface with each success successive cycle and less able to do um, electron transfer. Okay, so it's always important to do control experiments. So here we have a control experiment under anaerobic conditions. So we repeat the experiment with our sacrificial oxidant in the organic phase, but we remove oxygen. And by removing oxygen, we're eliminating the ability to do the interfacial redox electrocatalysis. Now, the cytochrome C can be reduced by decimethylferrocene, but that is the end of the process. It cannot be regenerated again. And we see a massive collapse in current in our cyclic voltammogram. Now, we don't see a complete disappearance of the electron transfer. If you zoom in in the inset, you can see that there is an electron transfer that looks relatively reversible between decmethylferrocene and cytochrome C. But it, no regeneration is taking place and the catalytic wave disappears. So we still have direct our electron transfer between the uh, organic oxidant and cytochrome C, just no more catalysis. So these control experiments show that oxygen is definitely involved in our um, electrochemical response, and this mechanism is looking good. So then we wanted to prove that we are reducing oxygen to hydrogen peroxide in the aqueous phase. So we did experiments at pH 2 in the presence of potassium iodide in the aqueous phase. Now potassium iodide will react with any hydrogen peroxide formed and cause the formation of triiodide species. And these triiodide species give very nice um, absorbance in UVV's um, absorbance measurements. And that's what we monitor. So we do in situ parallel beam UVV spectroscopy on the aqueous sided interface. And we monitor the production of hydrogen peroxide indirectly by its interaction with potassium iodide, which results in the formation of triiodide species. So the concentration of these triiodide species is clearly increasing with time during our double potential step chronoamperometry experiments. So this is an alternative to using cyclic voltammetry. So here we're switching between positive and negative potentials, and we are doing our electron transfer process that way. But it's basically the same thing. With time, more electron transfer is happening, more hydrogen peroxide is being formed, and we detect it spectroscopically. So we really are now mimicking the in vivo cytochrome C peroxidase activity of cytochrome C. We're using the slightly denatured cytochrome C to reduce a small molecule, oxygen in our case. Now, this is quite an amazing result. Direct electron transfer between decimethylferrocene and cytochrome C at a liquid-liquid interface has never been seen before. So in fact, no electron transfer uh, between any redox protein has been observed at a liquid-liquid interface before. So why is it happening in our system? So to further investigate this, we collaborated with Professor Damien Thompson's group at the University of Limerick, where he did molecular dynamics of our system. So we also noted that in our system, we do not see electron transfer at negative potentials. So at negative bias, we have no electron transfer, whereas at positive bias, we have a very strong electron transfer. And we believed that this was due to the orientation of cytochrome C changing at the different applied potentials in our liquid-liquid system. So the orientation of cytochrome C is critical. Even at solid electrode surfaces, you modify that surface in order to orientate the cytochrome C such that the active site is pointing towards the electrode and that the porphyrin heme group is at a 90 degree angle to that electrode surface. This is the perfect orientation in which to get electron transfer between the electrode surface and the um, active site, so the porphyrin in the active site. We need to do the same thing at the liquid-liquid interface. We need to orientate the cytochrome C stably in a way such that the active site is pointing directly at the organic phase where the electron donor or the sacrificial oxidant is. Only if our porphyrin is at a 90 degree angle to the organic phase and stuck at that position for the entire experiment will we get electron transfer between decimethylferrocene and the heme group in cytochrome C.
And amazingly, that is what happens at positive potential. So here we have the molecular dynamic snapshot and a negative bias. There's no preferred orientation of cytochrome C. At negative bias, you get a buildup of positively charged cations on the organic side of the interface. But these do not help to orientate the positively charged, uh, primarily, uh, cytochrome C molecule. It just rotates kind of uncontrollably at the interface. However, at positive bias, we get a buildup of negatively charged TB minus uh, organic anions. And these negative anions in the organic phase interact with positively charged lysine residues on the cytochrome C. And it so happens that these lysine residues surround the active site of the cytochrome C. So you get this electrostatic interaction between the lysine residues and the TB minus organic anions, sticking the cytochrome C in the perfect orientation with its active site pointing towards the oil phase. So you can see here you have the heme group and it's at a 90 degree angle to the organic phase. It's in the perfect orientation to accept an electron from decimetylferrocene. So this distance here will be less than a nanometer uh, based on the calculations and ideal for doing uh, electron transfer. So the two, the key process, the key point here is that the active site of cytochrome C is surrounded by positively charged lysine residues. These positively charged lysine residues are uh, pointing the cytochrome C at the interface due to their interaction with negatively charged TB minus anions. This is orientating the active site of the cytochrome C in a perfect way, such that the heme porphyrin now is at a 90 degree angle to the interface. So this is what uh, the molecular dynamic simulations look like when we run them. So you can see here at negative bias that the cytochrome C is moving around a lot. It's not finding a preferred orientation. It's not really interacting with the interface very much, and it's basically loose and not available to do electron transfer. Totally different scenario now with the positive biasing. The TB minus here in red is interacting with the lysine residues in green here in the cytochrome C, and the cytochrome C is stuck pointing at the interface, and it's um, really not moving around a lot at all. It's very stably orientated at positive potentials at the liquid-liquid interface. So this is quite a stunning result, and it's the key to why we see all of this electron transfer processes in our system. So uh, Professor Damien Thompson's group did a lot of rigorous analysis of their molecular dynamics. So here are some um, of these results. So here you have the density of the aqueous phase in blue here. So this is your aqueous phase over here. Here you have your interface, and here you have no density because you're in the oil phase. So this is your water, and this is where the cytochrome C is positioned near the interface at negative bias. It's actually quite far away from the interface. It's about five nanometers away from the interface. So that's too far away in order for it to be available to do electron transfer with the sacrificial oxidant in the organic phase. Now, if we go to positive bias, you can see that the cytochrome C may be even straddling the interface. It's right at the interface, readily available in terms of its distance from the organic phase to do interfacial electron transfer. We can look at the probability of the orientation of the cytochrome C at 90 degrees. So we can see a positive bias here. It is always at uh, orientated at 90 degrees to the interface, whereas a negative bias, the porphyrin is in an incorrect um, orientation to be able to do electron transfer. So it, it coming out at around 40 degrees orientation to the interface. Also, you can look at the number of contacts that take place between the lysine residue on cytochrome C and the organic TB minus anions. You can see that there's a lot of contacts and in a stable fashion a positive potential where you have much more random contacts between the TB minus and lysine at negative potentials. So here it's uncontrolled at negative potentials, but in the at positive potentials, you have a beautifully stable contact between the lysine residues and cytochrome C and the negatively charged organic TB minus anions. And this is the key to holding it in place and uh, allowing it to do electron transfer. So let's now use our biomembrane system for doing some interesting experiments. We found that we were able to distinguish between peripheral and transmembrane proteins using our setup. Here we have a series of cyclic voltammograms in the presence of decimetylferrocene with different um, cytochrome Cs. So we have a series of peripheral cytochrome Cs. So cytochrome C from equine, cytochrome C bovine, and cytochrome C552. So these are all peripheral membrane cytochrome C proteins, and they all behave as potent oxygen reduction electrocatalysts in our system. So equine and bovine are quite similar, but cytochrome C is a relative, or 552 is a relatively divergent mutant cytochrome C, but it's still a peripheral protein, and it's still active as an um, oxygen reduction electrocatalyst in our system. But then we changed to a transmembrane protein, cytochrome C1. 
And we found it was Redux inactive. And this is good because it's consistent with its role in vivo as an interprotein electron shuttle in the BC1 complex catalytic mechanism. So you can see the blue CV here is in the presence of cytochrome C1 and our electron transfer process has disappeared. And that's because it does not show peroxidase activity during apoptosis in vivo, and its heme group is less accessible in the protein matrix compared to that of cytochrome C or cytochrome C552. So it's a very nice result. We can really now distinguish in our uh, electrochemical cell between peripheral and transmembrane proteins being present in the aqueous We also applied it to a rapid, uh, as a rapid electrochemical diagnostic platform to screen drugs designed in silico that target the heme crevice of cytochrome C. So why is this important? So bifonazole, for example, is a drug that was predicted computationally to inhibit the proxies activity of cytochrome C in a dosage dependent manner. So this drug, which is typically used as an antifungal drug, was um, determined in a computational um, study that it would actively bind to the active site of cytochrome C and block it. And if it blocks that active site, then molecules such as hydrogen peroxide cannot enter. And if the molecule uh, hydrogen peroxide cannot enter, therefore you're actually going to stop apoptosis from taking place. You're going to stop the cytochrome C from generating more reactive oxygen species. So we, acted, we added bifonazole to our aqueous phase, and we saw our electron transfer process um, a step di diminish as the concentration of bifonazole increased. So it's a very, very nice result. We have confirmed experimentally that bifonazole does bind to the active site of cytochrome C because it is blocking our ability to do oxygen reduction with cytochrome C at the liquid-liquid interface. So as a control, we looked at a different drug, our biroterone acetate, and this is an inhibitor of cytochrome P450 17 alpha hydroxylase. It's a different family of cytochromes, and um, this drug, when we added it, did not have any significant effect on our interfacial electron transfer step. So adding any drug uh, will not uh, affect our interfacial electron transfer. It's only those drugs that bind to the active heme site of the cytochrome C that will decrease our interfacial electron transfer um, step. Okay, so let's look at some of the conclusions from our study. For the first ever time, we have shown direct interfacial electron transfer to a redox active protein at a polarized aqueous organic interface. Cytochrome C is acting as an electrocatalyst in our experiments. It's generating hydrogen peroxide and reactive oxygen species, and this is groundbreaking because it has direct relevance to studying cell death mechanisms such as apoptosis and other cell death mechanisms, which are all linked to re reactive oxygen species production. What's very nice is that we have an immediate impact of our system. Our electrified biointerface, liquid biointerface, can be used as a rapid electrochemical diagnostic platform to screen drugs that downregulate cytochrome C. So that means it inhibits they, they inhibit the reactive oxygen species from being produced. So these drugs again bind to the active site of cytochrome C, prevent the small molecules from binding to the iron heme group, and that's it. No more um, reactive oxygen species can be produced, and cytochrome C's activity is downregulated. Why is this important? These types of drugs are vital to protect against uncontrolled neuronal cell death in Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative diseases. So our electrochemical system can tell you if a particular drug may be good at being a at, at providing protection against uncontrolled neuronal cell death in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, for example. So a very nice result with real impact. Okay, so I'd like to finish with some acknowledgements. I'd like to thank my funding agencies, the ERC, Irish Research Council, and Science Foundation Ireland. I'd particularly like to thank my former postdoc, Alonso Gamero Cujano, who did amazing work on this project and has a real passion for bioelectrochemistry. I'd like to thank Professor Chufik Suleiman, who provided Cytochrome C552 for our studies, and also Damien Thompson's group, and especially the postdocs in this group, Dr. Uh, Cheyenne and Pierre. And I'd also like to thank Greg Herzog. So Gregor Herzog, who is, works at the University of Lorraine. And this project began with a conversation me and Greg had around 2015 about wouldn't it be fun to do electron transfer with cytochrome C at a liquid-liquid interface. And finally, I'd like to thank you for watching my presentation today.